Catholic Church. How's everybody doing? You doing good? Yeah. All right. Uh, let me introduce myself real quick in case you don't know. Um, I'm Eric Joyner. I'm the youth pastor here along with my beautiful wife. Give me an opportunity just to call her out. That is my wife. You don't know how I did it. That is my wife. Uh, before I get started, I, I would like to pray, but before I, I pray, because I feel like it's difficult to go into a message and not pray before doing so, um, I want you to take a, a moment and just say something with me, okay? I want you to say the term, not today, Satan. Not today. All right, so this is a uh, little bracelet I wear. It says, not today, Satan, on it. This is a nice reminder to me whenever uh, I feel like things are rough or something's coming on me. I can look at it as a reminder that uh, the devil has no control on me, right? And the devil has no control on you this morning. So I want you, if you would, just close your eyes real quick and just think about that again. Not today, Satan, because the devil wants to try and hinder you from receiving this morning. The devil wants to put in your mind distractions and things that will keep you from receiving from the Lord. We just went through a great worship experience, and, and if you didn't feel anything from that, then I would say the devil's already working pretty hard on you today. So, not today, Satan. Father, I just pray that you would give freedom and liberty to your children in the house this morning. That you would remove every bondage and every stronghold and every distraction that the devil has tried to place on their heart and their mind. That this would be a distraction-free zone. That, Father, as we go into the word, that you would uh, allow them to have ears to hear and hearts to receive. That the devil has no part of them this morning. And he will have no part of them from this day forward. That they can say, not today, Satan, and not ever again, will you distract me from receiving from the Lord. So, Father, I pray for just freedom this morning to receive and freedom for us to move forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you uh, for that. So, uh, the title of my message this morning is called, uh, Where is Your Passion? It's a pretty generic title, if I was to be honest. Uh, I had a hard time going back and forth on what, what the kind of title would be. I've changed it a couple times, and, and when I went to even save this on my computer, I realized I preached a message with this exact same title five years ago. And uh, I went and looked at what five years ago Eric spoke about and, and realized that it was, you know, a different view in a different direction. So it's, it's good to know that even when titles can seem generic, God never is. Amen? They even bring a fresh word, a fresh perspective, and things that may seem like it's uh, generic. And one thing I do want to share from that five years ago message, which is probably my, my favorite thing, and um, I'm not great, and I recognize this, and it's something I want God to help me out with, at being very, very illustrative with the word. When I read a, a passage, it just a lot of times is like black and white to me. I read a story, and it's black and white. And I hear people, you know, expound upon these things, and they come up with these grand images, and I'm like, ah, oh, I, I just can't believe they could do that. But there is one, one portion of scripture that I'm able to kind of get imagery for, and to come along with me on this journey, I need to know, by a show of hands, who has seen Forrest Gump? All right, good. So this has nothing to do with what the message is going to be today, but it is a fun part, so I just wanted to share it. In the scripture, there's a portion after Jesus ascends into heaven, and well, actually before that. The disciples are back out in the boat, and they're fishing because Jesus is gone, and they've gone back to his life as they know it. And they see a man on the shore, and all the disciples are sitting there, and Peter realizes, he says, that's the Savior. And Peter immediately jumps out of the boat and swims to Jesus, okay? Now, every time I think of that scripture, I picture Forrest Gump out there shrimp boat fishing, Lieutenant Dan is rolled up on the dock there in his wheelchair, and Forrest just forgets everything and just jumps out of his boat, doesn't care about the boat, doesn't care about anything, and just swims because he just loves that man and just wants to see him and get to him as quickly as possible. So, uh, hopefully, if you think of that scripture, you also think of Forrest Gump like me, and uh, that, that is all that five years ago Eric wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, so let's talk about what current Eric wants to talk about today. Amen? So, uh, passion. Passion is vital to life. Uh, without a passion for something, then you lose the will to live. You find people as they age, they'll try to find ways to 
have something to be passionate about. As they retire and they're not working, they, they slow down and they feel like there's nothing worth or they feel like it is deteriorating. So, you know, people go and get dogs or, or they try to find something to invest in themselves in because passion is important. Because without a desire for something to live for, we just waste away. Our flesh desires the passions of this world. We desire uh, things like sports. You know, the books are going to be in the Super Bowl. Woo woo, right? Yeah. I got a Gators cup. I have a passion for the Gators. And if you don't, I'm sorry for you. Uh, but in life, yes, sir. Uh, in life, we have a passion, like our flesh desires that these sports, or, or we may desire to have a passion for celebrities and, and what they're doing. Politics, oh my Lord. We have a passion for politics, and we let everybody know about it. Um, you know, we have a passion for things of this world, and that's what our flesh desires, but our soul is sitting there crying out, wanting us to have a passion for God. And wanting us to want what God wants in our life. And our flesh is just focused on things of this world and it's focused on every other thing but God in our heart. And our soul is just crying out, but where is God? Where is his priority in the passions of your life? You see, there's a lot of people that are good. And you may be one of those people that you're a good person and you come to church and that you think that means that you have a passion for God, but you don't. Just being a good person and, and saying nice things and doing nice things for people and, and showing up and, you know, maybe standing up those worship time, clapping a hand, singing along, leaving, never changed. It doesn't mean you have a passion for God. And so many of us are confused about our passion and how it's supposed to progress over time because once you get saved, that's not just it. It isn't just I got saved and now I love God and and I just leave everything else, and, and that, that's all. You know, your passion should progress over time where you want to get deeper and deeper into a relationship with God where there's stages of what you want to do and what you want to have happen in your life. So today, when I talk about the passion, I want to talk about three different stages, progressive stages of how our passion with God should grow. And I want you to know that this message applies to everybody here. There's not a single person that can't progress in their passion for God. There's not a single person here that's reached the pinnacle of, of what it is to be a Christian, that they have no work left to be done, but everybody has an opportunity to grow. So the first one, which is already up there, is I want to talk about having a passion for a relationship with God. When you go and you get saved, that's where it all starts. You want to have a relationship with this person that just wrecked your world and took everything away that was once there and was breaking you down and tearing you apart. And you have a passion that's set right in God when he means more than anything else in life and you prove it in how you act. You see, a lot of people, we think, just because I say I love God or just because I show up to church, it means I have a relationship and it means that I'm passionate about God. But it's truly in how do you act? When you leave this place, how is that relationship with God exhibited to the world? How do they see him in your life? When you leave and you go to the restaurant and you're rude to the waiter or waitress, or you don't leave a tip because they didn't do something right by you, or you get to work on Monday and you're grumbling about the boss or your coworkers or whatever, how are we showing that we're passionate for God in a relationship with him? It's all about how we act. You see, unfortunately for many, a relationship with God is a one-way street. And they believe that it should end in them receiving something for free. So we feel like, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I love God. That means he just gives, 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 gives. I just sit here. It's like I've reached the end of the rainbow. There is the, the leprechaun with the gold coins. Everything is great. I am blessed and highly favored, and I require nothing of you. I'm just here to receive, God. I'm just here to pour it out, rain down, God. See, it's unfortunate that so many of us think it's a one-way street. It's all, it's all take and no give. Many do not understand that a relationship 
we, God requires giving a lot of things away. When you truly want to have a relationship with God and you truly want your passion and Him to be the number one thing in your life, it requires you to give up a lot. It requires you to give up your time. Because you could be somewhere else other than here. You could be somewhere else other than here on Wednesdays, and most of you are. <laughs> If you felt that, it's because you needed to, okay? It requires a lot, because you know what, God isn't just Sundays, He ain't just Wednesdays. You know, there used to be a time churches had Sunday night services. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> they used to also have Sunday school before the Sunday morning service. Y'all remember those days when the entire day was honestly going to church? And when you were a kid and you had to hate your parents all day instead of just the morning? Oh, man. And now it's like I've grumbled so much because my passion isn't really about a relationship with God that if my service isn't just an hour, if I'm not in and out, then forget that church. I need to get in and i got to get out and I better not leave anything changed. I, I want to come in and leave the same. And if something changes in my life, or if we drag it out a little bit, if I'm late getting to, to, to lunch and the Baptist beat me, then heaven forbid, I mean, don't you let the Holy Spirit move, because I can't have it. But come on now, that's, that's honestly, that's us. That's us in the church, that's the American church. We've pulled it all out and we've said, that's not really what I'm about, because my passion isn't really about a relationship with God. My passion is whatever else it is in my life. It may be my marriage. It may be my kids. It may be my job. It may be my sports. It may be something. Like, if you don't let me get out so I can catch that 1 o'clock kickoff, then, oh, my Lord, you have ruined my day. And listen, this is not to condemn, because I'll tell you what, next Sunday during the Super Bowl, they best work on those small groups, okay? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to stir up anything. There's, there's a level that we have to understand, right? But there has to be give and take, but we can't, we can't just have it, you know, we got to have a little bit of a push because it is our time. Relationship with God does take time. It should. If it doesn't, then you don't have a relationship. It should take over your life. If your life, once you met with Jesus, is the same as it was before, you don't have a relationship. You know, you should lose people when you come to Jesus Christ. There should be people that knew you that said, I can't be around you anymore because you're not the same person. If they can look at you and they say, you're exactly the same, nothing's changed, you're just the next hypocrite in line for them. A true relationship with God is going to wreck your, your relationships on this earth. Your time and your, and your relationships, your life is going to change. And it's all because you're also going to have a change in your heart. The things that once excited you never do, they don't. You know, before I truly gave my heart to God, I would love to, like, I love to joke. And you guys know that, I joke up here. But the type of levels that I would joke were a lot worse then than they are today, I'd say some stuff that would, whew, I don't know, make a tomato blush, I guess. You know, and there would be language that would come out of my mouth that's unfit. And you know, there was people in my life, I had siblings that, you know, I would joke a lot about, and we would talk about women and womanizing types and talk rude and crude about females. And as soon as I stopped, he's like, I don't want to hang out with you no more. You're not the same. I got nothing for you because I don't want to do it. See, so many just think it's a one-way street. I, I've given God my heart. You know, I've, I've accepted him into my heart. That's it. This is just easy street now. It's just blessings upon blessings upon blessings. And I am positive that many Christians have entered churches today and they believe they should receive something from God but they didn't do anything to prepare themselves to receive. There are many, I am sure, 
many even in this church this morning, that they didn't pray before coming here. They didn't ask God about, they didn't pray about this service, and they didn't ask God to move. They didn't pray and ask God to move in their heart. They didn't ask God to move in somebody else's life. They didn't ask God to reveal something this morning. They didn't search their heart and say, God, where is there some sin I need forgiveness of before I come into your house? And I guarantee they didn't spend much of the six days prior to today reading the word and praying. And they've come in this morning, many Christians have come in and they said, I'm expecting to receive. I'm expecting to get something. But I didn't come prepared to receive. I didn't come preparing my heart and my life to receive. And unfortunately for most Christians, if they leave church the same way they came in, it's everyone's fault but their own. The worship team didn't do it good enough. The pastor didn't preach the right word to hit my heart. I just wasn't feeling it. And it's everybody else's fault but our own, but we didn't really invest in our relationship with God. We didn't say, God, what do you have for me today? Reveal yourself to me today. Show me something new today. You know, I, I said this while I was leading the transition prayer last week, and it's something that God has put on my heart and something that I've just been torn up about, but we need to understand that if you want to eat, you have to come hungry. You can't come in and say, you know what, I'm going to get something from God, but i got a full stomach. You know, you're not going to leave this place. You're not going to sit here, chow down a meal, and then drive to Chili's and be like, I don't know, what do I want to wear? I'm not really hungry. You know, you have to come in expecting something. You have to come in desiring something if you want to eat. Because it isn't about everybody else and what they've done, but it's about you and it's about your relationship. It's about your passion for God. If you don't have that passion for that relationship, you're not going to get anything. Because your ability to receive from God is directly related to your passion for God. If you don't have a passion for Him, if you don't have a passion for what He has for you in your life, if you don't have a passion to see Him move, not just in your life, but the life of your family, the life of your brothers and sisters in the house, if you don't get stirred up when you see somebody else receiving from God, if it doesn't touch your own heart, if you don't have that passion, don't expect to receive. It's like showing up saying, give me something, but you didn't bring me anything to carry it out in. You're a filled up vessel. You're not even empty. You got nothing for them to pour into. If you want to experience God, then show up desiring God. Matthew 5, 6 very clearly tells us, blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. I, it doesn't say blessed are those that are already full for right, from righteousness will be filled. It doesn't say those that feel like they've already achieved righteousness will be filled. Has anybody ever been hungry here? You ever desire to eat? Okay, one person. Eddie, thank you, sir. Eddie's been hungry before. The rest of you, apparently, first world problems, have never been hungry. Has anybody ever been thirsty? Okay, a few, a few more. So everybody's well fed, but not necessarily well hydrated. It's all you can think about. When you're hungry for food, when your stomach is like feeding me, it's all you can think about. When your throat is dry, and you're like, I need something to drink, it's all you can think about. You can't think about anything else. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you can't think about anything else. The devil can't come in and distract you with some other temptation. He can't come in and get you distracted on whatever else is your problem because you know what? I don't hunger and thirst for the world. I don't hunger and thirst to be desired by somebody else. I don't hunger and thirst for a promotion. I don't hunger and thirst for man's approval. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when you do, look at Phil. 
man, that's simple. If I come in wanting God, if I come in desiring God, if I come in saying, God, you are what I'm here for this morning, you'll get it. Wow. That seems like a pretty, two, pretty easy two-step process. I come in wanting God, and God says, here I am. That doesn't seem difficult to me. Does that seem difficult to anybody in the house? Okay, good. Because see, too many people are walking in the churches full of the world and have no hunger for God and wonder why they leave the place unchanged. We're too full of the world. We're too full of everything else. We haven't even asked God to check our heart and realize, what do we need to be broken from today? Because guess what? There's not a saint in this house that doesn't have something on their heart that God doesn't want to change. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a board member. I don't care if you're a senior pastor or a spouse or a senior pastor or whatever. God wants to do something in your life. He wants to change something. He wants to convict and lead you to something greater. And if we don't come in thinking that, if we don't come in expecting or wanting, then guess what? Nothing's going to change. You know, I brought these, uh, these little water bottles up here. This is, this is demonstration purposes, but also drink purposes because... You get thirsty. For the hunger and thirst for righteousness. See what I did there? So, let me just give you a little, a little demonstration here, okay? This is uh, what's affectionately known as my sippy cup. I got this a while back. And uh, prior to 2021, Hollywood asked me constantly, how much water have you had today? And typically my answer would be, a lot. Coke has water, that's the main ingredient. Tea has water, it's also the main ingredient. So I've had a lot of water today. So how much water, just water, have you had today? None. See, me, prior to, prior to 2020, and especially when I worked in an office, I'd go in and I'd fill up a cup like this with some coffee. I'd get one cup of coffee. I'd drink that bad boy down. And then I'd go back into the nice little office break area and I'd fill this cup up with some water. And that would be the amount of water I would drink all day. Okay? Maybe at lunch, if I went out, I might go get myself a soda or something. But this was essentially, and to be honest, not even all the time because I'd be drunk all the way. Uh, or drink, sorry, Plant City, I can't speak. Uh, <laughs> but I would not drink enough water, okay? The wife and I, we're trying to lose weight in 2021. You may have noticed that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, now, this is something my wife blessed me with to say, hey, it's got to be nice little at 8 o'clock, you know, start here. At 11 o'clock should be here. Now I fill this bad boy up with water in the morning. And by the end of the day, I need to drink this whole guy. I went from here, and now I'm here. I hated water. I hated drinking water. Okay? Just like it. But you know what I found when I started drinking this? <laughs> what I found is the more that I would drink, the more I desired to drink. The more that I brought some water into my mouth, and the more that I saw it, the quicker my throat would get dry. The quicker I felt like I needed to replenish with that water. Let me tell you, church. The more you get into God, and the more that you drink of what he has, the more you want, and the more you desire, to where you say, I don't need this much of God all day. I need this much of God all day, because I want to drink it up, because I want more and more, because as we've said over the last couple of weeks, taste and see that he's good, right? This is good. And as soon as I get it into my body, I already want more. I just took a sip, but I want more. My throat is parched. I want more. I didn't care about it before, but now I do. A lot of people don't care about the relationship with God. They don't care whether they're getting enough. They don't care that, you know what, Sunday's all they get, and that's fine. They don't care that they're not getting into their word. They don't care that they're not praying. But once you start... And once you get into it, you realize what you've been missing, and you realize how much more of it that you want. Once you've gotten to that place where you're like, hey, I got my passion for a relationship with God. 
Once you've truly devoted yourself to God, then the next progression is you should have a passion for spreading the gospel. Because once you've truly received from God, you can't help but tell somebody else about it. The Bible is full of examples. It wouldn't be hard for me to just randomly go through and pull off any name of somebody that received from God and then just immediately turn around and go tell everybody they knew. You see, we have been called, God has called us to go out and proclaim the good news. Every single one of us has been called to be missionaries in some way, shape, or form. We have been called to be passionate about pouring out the gospel everywhere we go. And telling everybody about what God has done in our life. It ain't hard to hear about what God has done in Ted's life. I'll tell you that. We heard a lot of emails this morning. There's not a moment I interact with Ted. I don't hear something about what God's done in his life. Yeah. Amen for that. God wants to use you. He wants to be poured out of you. Even if you think you're another believer and it doesn't mean anything, it does. God has done something in your life, and it's not just for you. It's for you to share and let other people know about the goodness of God because we're going through things. And even believers, we go through things, and we need to hear about the goodness of God in somebody else's life. And so many of us have words from God that we put on our heart, and we just squash it, and we don't care. And I can't help but think, and listen to Jeremiah 20, verse 9. He says, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is like a is, is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in, indeed, I cannot. A word that is like a fire in your bones. You know what I find, and, and this is one of the things I, I, I struggle with, is when I feel like God puts something in my heart. I feel like I want that to be like the thing that comes out like right away. And to be honest, like the, the word for, for this morning, you know, I felt like I got it weeks ago. And there's a couple new things that have come up on my heart since then that I've kind of jotted down. And because there's something newer, I want to be like, oh, I don't really care about this one. And it's, ah, let, me, let me move to the new one. But you know what? God put a fire in my heart for this word for this morning. And how, how dare I would try to hold it back? Because it's meant for you. It's not meant for me. It's meant for your glory, for God's glory. So you know what? I won't hold it back. I won't hold back what God has for you. And the one thing to understand is, in this portion of Scripture, things were going great for Jeremiah. Jeremiah was going around delivering some harsh words to people. And guess what? When you, when you try to correct or rebuke somebody, they don't tend to like it. You know? Yeah. Nobody really likes being corrected or rebuked are told about the, the bad things that are coming upon them. So Jeremiah was being ridiculed, mocked, beaten, and even jailed for sharing what God put in his heart. But what he said is, he's like, I wish I didn't, but it's too much like a fire. It's too much burning in my soul that I can't hold it in. I have to let it go. That's what we need to progress to. Once we've gotten that relationship with God, Anytime that he puts on our heart to go and talk to somebody at the supermarket or the grocery store, let me not go too old school. When, when he puts on our heart to go talk to somebody, anybody, to just share something, no matter how ridiculous it may sound or feel, that we don't care, but we just share it because we know that if we hold it in, it's going to hurt. It's going to burn too much in us. So we have to get it out. Let us get to a place where we don't care what the world thinks about the word that God has put on our heart, but we only care about being obedient. And we only care about being passionate in sharing what God entrusts us to share. He's giving you that word for a reason. You know, many times we'll sit back and we'll think, is this God? You know, the devil's not going to give you a word for somebody else. The devil's not going to tell you to speak in tongues. The devil's not going to tell you to run around this church like a crazy person, okay? The devil's not going to do something that's going to edify God. So if you feel like God put something on your heart that's meant to lift somebody up, that's meant to encourage, it's going to bring them to a better place, don't hold that back. That's God. That's not you. That's not the pizza you ate last night. That's God. 
Be obedient. We need to care more about being obedient than persecution. You know, I think Pastor mentioned this a few weeks ago. That, you know, they may get mad at you. They may get mad at what you say. But what's worse is being disobedient. When God puts it on our heart, we can't say, oh, man, well, what if this person doesn't like it? What if, what if they don't receive what I have for them? What if, you know, they, they get mad at me? Oh, my. What if they call me a word? What if this is the last time God gives you a word? Because you were disobedient. Let me fear the ability of God to stop using me more than what the world will do if I'm being used. Let me care more about being obedient in persecution. Let me care more about sharing the gospel. Because you know what? It isn't easy to share the word of God. It's not. I know I make it look easy. Let me drink my big old cup of water. But you know what? There's many people, myself included, that fall short and they discredit their ability to preach when they see a lack of participation from the congregation. You know, I can't tell you the times that, you know, when Holly and I were, were young adults pastors here, we were young adults pastors for five years. There was one service, yep, thank you, old school next members. Um, there was, a, there was a service one time where it was me, Holly, and the guy that was doing worship. And that was it. And you know what I did? I preached what God put in my heart. It didn't care that nobody else showed up. You know, the very last night, I hoped and I prayed that all of these people that were most part of the group would come back and just enjoy one last service together. And we came and we met in here because we used to meet in the old sanctuary. And I was like, oh, man, we might have a lot of people. We're going to meet in here. Handful, maybe. But definitely less than 10. And I'd be hard for us to say it was more than five, sure. But you know what? I still deliver what God had in my heart. Because you know what? It isn't about me, it's about them. You know, I already talked about how messed up you guys come in here. You come in unprepared, unwilling to receive. Your heart's not ready. So it's not my fault if you don't get something. I'm doing what God called me to do. What are you doing? <laughs> now, I'll tell you, there's a little bit that's not my fault. Because if I ain't obedient to God and I don't deliver what he's got, God can still slap you right across the face, even if you weren't ready for it, and wake you up. But you know what? If you're hungry enough, even if the word isn't exactly for you, you can find enough crumbs to get it. If you're hungry enough for God and you come into this place, you can find something to leave that's changed your heart. And there's many preachers, you know, we hear about pastors that are doing things that are wrong in the world. And, and we understand how, how do they even have, you know, a people to speak to because it wasn't about them. God doesn't care. Like, it's not about me. It's about you. God wants you to get something out of today. He wants you to leave change. So it doesn't matter how faulty I am. He's going to give something for you to hear and receive. And you know what? He already beat me up about it. So now it's your turn. See, too many pastors, they mess up when they think the ability to move a service is about them. It isn't about us. It isn't about even when you go and you... It's not even necessarily a pulpit. When you're at the grocery store and you tell somebody about Jesus, it isn't about you. It's about them. And it's not up to, you know, you to determine whether or not they fully accept it or not. You know, one of the many terms that they said, you may be planting the seed, you may be watering the seed. You know? But it's up to God to make that seed grow. And you don't know where you're at in that process. So you just be obedient. You just do what God called you to do. And you share that next passion in your heart. And God's put in there, and you allow God to move. You know, Pastor, two weeks ago, we talked about these altars and how we wish these things would be full. He knows that's not on him. That's on you guys. Let me just ask this question. Feel free to raise your hand if this is you. Is anybody in here the second coming of Jesus? 
Anybody in here, Jesus? Not here, Jesus. I know where Paul's at. Anybody in here, Jesus? I got my glasses on, so I see pretty good. I don't see any hands. All right, good. So if Jesus is not physically here as the second coming in any of you here, then guess what? There's no finished products in this room, and each one of you need prayer. Each one of you. Not a single one of you are too saintly to be in the altar. Each one of you are not too blessed and highly favored to be prayed for. To tell somebody what you're going through and to have God, you know, meet you in the altar. You're not too saintly in case you can't make it to the altar. You're the physical limitations to say, hey, can you come back here and pray for me? And we've already heard this many a times, but Pastor mentioned it last week. I feel like it's maybe the word for the season because I've heard it a few times already. But when you taste and see that the Lord is good, then you want more. It is. You just do. And when God meets you in the altar and he changes you and he deals with whatever it is that you're dealing with, the next time it's easy. Let me just come on down there. God's going to meet me there. And you want more because your passion is growing for God. And because your passion is growing for God, you want to tell other people about it. And that's the progression. The last stage of the passion and the progression that I want to share is a passion for the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? There, it's one thing to get saved. It's one thing to have God in your heart. It's one thing to want to tell everybody about what he's done. And then it's another to want the Holy Spirit fully operate in your life. There's a quote that, uh, honestly, what I found quite odd is widely speculated as to who really says it. Some people say John Wesley, but a lot of historians dispute that. But I like the quote either way, so I'm going to say it for you here. It says, I set myself on fire with passion, and people come from miles to watch me burn. You know, let us be somebody that is so passionate for God, that is so on fire for God, that people just can't help but want to come and be in your presence so that they can hear about what God is doing. That you're so passionate that this isn't just something, some phase you're going through or just something that you kind of dabble in, but you are so deep in passion and in relationship with God that you're so deep in believing what it is that God has spoken to you. That you're so on fire that the Holy Spirit moves so strongly in your life that people can't help but be drawn to you. That people say, what is different? What is happening? You know, there are people that we hear, and it's like, it's so amazing because they're so confident. They're so sure of what they're sharing. It's not just like some fleeting thought or something they hope is true, but they know it within their heart and within their spirit and in their bones. They just believe it to be true. Yeah. And it makes us just want to follow and wants us to listen. Because you know what? We have a problem here in our church. Not just TLC. I'm not just talking about here. I'm talking about the church in America. In church, we have a lot of firefighters and not many fire starters. You see, we have a lot of people that are really ready to squish out whatever you got going to try and prevent this from turning into a three-hour service, to try and prevent it from going all day, to try and prevent revival from happening, to try to prevent somebody from, from really letting the Holy Spirit use them, and not enough people saying, forget it, light me on fire, and let people see what the Lord is doing. There's not enough people saying, light me up, God. Let me catch a fire. Let the Holy Spirit use me. Let, let me be afraid of speaking in tongues and what somebody else thinks. Let somebody else catch it. Let somebody else feel the passion and the fire that I have for Jesus. Because there's too many. There's too many that want this to be comfortable. They don't want you to be uncomfortable in the house of God. But that is what God is here to do. To make you uncomfortable, to convict you and bring change. Yeah. If you're comfortable and you feel good and you leave the same, he wants you to leave change. Yeah. So we set up processes and there's structures and you've got to fit this time limit. If we don't, then we're going to lose people. I want to see 
fire starters in the house of God. I want to see people operating in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. That say, you know what? It's one thing to have a relationship with God. I feel great. I know that he's there. I can receive a word. And it's one thing that I'm telling everybody about it. But I want the fullness. I want everything that he's got for me. And that means I want the Holy Spirit in my heart guiding and directing every step that I take, helping me to understand where I'm at. And when I come into church, it's not something that has to be stirred up in my heart, but I'm primed and ready to go. Because the Holy Spirit's been working on me all week because he's not just somebody I meet here on Sunday. He's somebody that I take with me when I leave. So I don't come here to meet the Holy Spirit. I come here with the Holy Spirit. You don't come here to meet God. God's already in your heart. He should be there all the time. If you're coming here to meet him, you got it all wrong. Because we need to understand that when the Holy Spirit is operating, there's, there's freedom in the house. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? There is freedom. Freedom. So I don't have to feel like I'm worried about what somebody else has to say or do. I don't have to feel worried about whether it offended somebody, how I worship, or what happens. Because you know what? There's freedom in the house. There's liberty in the house. When we get to that step, and we can operate in the fullness of God through the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and we don't need the worship team to usher us in. You know, there's a great I feel like every Sunday for a while now, by the time they're done, whew, man, there is just a great movement of the Holy Spirit happening. But you know what? It would be great if we started there. It'd be great if it didn't take two, three songs to get us to that point. It'd be great if, if you were already ready to go and the Holy Spirit was already touching your heart. And when the first little stroke of a piano went or Whatever happened is your hands were up and you were ready to get to this altar. You were on your knees. You were praying. You were crying out. It'd be great. Imagine how much more could happen if we were crying and ready to go. If we didn't have to be, you know, crank started like some kind of old school car. God's looking for some Ferraris ready to go. And we got some jalopy that has to be like cranked up and trying to do like 10 different things with a thick screwdriver in and twist it a certain way to get the thing started. God's saying, come on, let's go. He, trust me, we're not waiting on him. <laughs> we're not waiting on him, church. He's waiting on us. So that would be awesome if they didn't have to get us there in two to three songs, but we could be there already. And it would be great if we didn't have to wonder or worry are these altars going to be full because we don't have to because our church is so full of the Holy Spirit that they've been bringing in the lost. And there are people sitting out here that don't know nothing about the Lord, but because of the worship, because of the experience, they've already felt the presence of the God of, in the house. And then they saw the preaching of the gospel being delivered, and they felt it, and they were convicted until the place was flooded with those lost and those that know that they need a touch. Yeah. That would be great. It would be great if the presence was evident. From the beginning to the end, the whole way, and lives were changed, and we saw, and we all could celebrate and rejoice together. And it all starts with our passion. Where's our priority? Where is it? I had to call up the worship team this morning. I'm going to take another sip from my big old cup. It would be great, God, if we would just be ready to go. It would be a lot easier on the worship team. It would be a lot easier on our senior pastor. If they knew they had hungry, hungry, not hungry, hungry hit folks, hungry, hungry congregation. <laughs> People ready and hungry for what God has for them. If we could just feel it emanating from out there to here. That there is a body of believers that want nothing more than to see God wreck this place and wreck everybody around us. 
See, the Bible is full of people that risked it all just for a relationship. You look at those disciples when they were first called, they left everything. They left family, they left jobs, they left it all just for a relationship to Jesus Christ. Many people risked it all just to be able to call him Savior, just to be able to call him Lord and say that he is the Lord of their life. What have you risked this morning? Have you risked anything at all? Or have you risked everything for this relationship, for this man to come and to pour into your life and to give you something new? I said it at the beginning. This message is for everybody today. Everybody here needs a fresh touch. Everybody here needs to be regrounded in their passion. And where is it at? What takes priority right now? If you wouldn't mind, just bow your heads and close your eyes. A couple things I want you to think about this morning as I say that this message is for everybody. If you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you want to get your life right by putting him as your passion today. And guess what? This message is for you. If your passion is falling off, and you were once on fire and now you're just a slow burning ember, then guess what? This message is for you. If you used to go around and share the gospel and tell everybody how good the Lord is, and you told everybody about the fullness and the greatness of God, and you feel like it's been a while since the Lord has touched your heart and led you to speak to anybody, and you aren't hearing him like you used to. This message is for you. If it's been a long time since you've been slain in the Spirit, and maybe it's even been a long time since you've heard that term, it's been a long time since you've prayed in tongues, or maybe you've never prayed in tongues, this message is for you. David said in Psalms 42.1 that as a deer pants for streams of water so my soul pants for you God. God wants to do something in your life this morning. He wants to redirect your passion to him. And he wants to get you back in the progression of where he's calling you to be. 